We are going to cover a case study on fraud modeling in this session. The agenda of the session is going to mirror the standard modeling methodology. We will start by defining the problem. We will then explore the data that is there with us. We will prepare the data for modeling. We will create a logistic regression model and then we will validate the data. In this session, we will not spend too much time on model implementation and tracking. That's out of scope for this particular case study. So let's start with the first step of the modeling methodology, that of problem definition. In order to understand the problem definition for this particular case study, we need to understand how credit card processing works. So it typically starts with a seller having something that the buyer wants to buy. The buyer wants to use the credit card to make the payment. Now you have to understand a credit card is not really a payment. A credit card is more a promise to pay. The seller is not actually receiving the money in his hands when he's doing a credit card transaction. So the first thing the seller needs to do is to verify if the account actually exists and if it does, is there enough credit to cover the transaction? The shopper hands over her credit card to the seller. The seller then swipes the credit card in the credit card machine. When the seller swipes the credit card, one of the things that happens is that an inquiry is raised with the issuing bank. The issuing bank is the bank that has issued the shopper's credit card. So when the seller swipes the card, he is basically sending an inquiry to the issuing bank asking if this account actually exists and if there is enough credit to cover the transaction. If the answer to both these questions is yes, then the seller receives the authorization from the issuing bank. Once the seller has received the authorization from the issuing bank, he goes ahead with the transaction. The seller now understands that he can make a claim on the buyer's line of credit and he can go ahead with the transaction. The seller still does not have the money. Now the process of the seller receiving the money for this transaction is not a straightforward process. The first step in that process is that the issuing bank will make a payment to the acquiring bank. This happens typically at the end of each day when all banks come together and settle their claims against each other. In this case, the issuing bank will look at the acquiring bank's claim and will transfer the money to the acquiring bank. The acquiring bank will then release this money into the seller's account. Now the seller has received his money. Meanwhile, the issuing bank will post the charge on the buyer's credit card. The buyer will then make his payment and settle the whole transaction. So this is how a typical transaction happens. Now what happens in, in the case of a fraudulent transaction? In the case of a fraudulent tra transaction, it is someone other than the card holder who's gone ahead and made the transaction. So now when the shopper sees the transaction in his credit card bill, she will raise a complaint with the issuing bank. So she will go back to the issuing bank and say, look, this transaction that you've posted on my statement is not something that I've made and I don't want to pay for this. The issuing bank is now going to go back to the acquiring bank, which is the seller's bank and say that the transaction for which I paid you was a fraudulent transaction. So I need to take the money back from you. The acquiring bank will now go back to the merchant and say that the transaction that I paid you for was a fraudulent transaction and I need the money back from you. So if you notice, it's the merchant who ultimately ends up bearing the brunt of the fraud. The merchant has to pay the money back to the acquiring bank and the acquiring bank will pay the money back to the issuing bank, which will then credit it back into the customer's account. So that's how fraud liability works. Now, the merchant bears the risk in most of the cases, but the acquiring bank also bears a large amount of risk. And that largely comes from the credit worthiness of the merchant. So there are two cases in which the merchant will not pay the acquiring bank. First case is when the merchant itself is indulging in these fraudulent activities, in which case the merchant has basically deceived the acquiring bank and has made the fraud fraudulent transactions and it's not going to pay the acquiring bank back. The second case is when the merchant does not have the ability to pay. The merchant has declared bankruptcy and does not have the ability to pay the acquiring bank. In this case, again, the acquiring bank bears the risk. 
So it's largely the merchants and the acquiring bank or the merchant bank which bear the risk of fraudulent transactions. So this is where our case study comes in. Our client is the acquiring bank or the merchant bank. The business problem is to strengthen the fraud detection strategy, use historical data on merchant performance to identify merchants that are likely to indulge in fraudulent activities. The acquiring bank is basically trying to build better predictive models in order to strengthen its fraud detection strategy. The analytics problem here is fairly simple. Use historic data to build a predictive model to predict fraudulent activities. The target variable here being GT2, which denotes whether a merchant in the historical data was fraud or not. The value is good for all good merchants and the value is one for fraud merchants. So we have a variable GT2, which takes the value of zero for all good observations and one for fraud observations. The historical data that we have consists of 254,056 merchants. 253,048 of them are good merchants and 1,008 are bad observations or bad merchants. So we have data on a large number of merchants and we have data on 1,008 fraudulent transactions or fraudulent merchants. We have about 30 to 40 variables which we can use to build the model to predict fraud and the target variable is GT2.